Welcome to a meeting of the Boston Region Metro and Planning Organization. I'm David Muller, our Secretary Jamie Tesler here. All participants will join the meeting with muted microphones. Please rename yourself to include your first name, last name, and affiliation if you have one. Please do not unmute and mute yourself. To participate in the discussion, please select the raised hand function. Find this by clicking either on the participants button at the bottom of the screen, and a window will pop up with a raise hand button at the bottom, or the reactions button in the toolbar. The chair will then call on participants. If you are on the phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact Rosine Foley via the chat box at rfolei at ctps.org or call her at 857-702-3704. This meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Zoom products are compliant, with exceptions, with the following standards. Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 Level AA Standards and Revised Section 508 Standards. If you require any additional accommodations in order to participate fully in this meeting, please contact Rogine Foley of the MPO staff at rfolei at ctps.org or call her at 857-702-3704. Now it's time for introductions. So Jonathan, please call the roll. Hi, David. I'll be calling the roll today. Um, Mascot Chair. I am here, David Moeller. Thank you. Mascot C2. Uh, John Bichette representing Highway Administrator Jonathan Gulliver here. Mascot Highway Division. John Romano here. MBTA. Julian Linnell on behalf of General Manager Steve Poftak. Massachusetts Port Authority. Okay, uh, MAPC. Good morning, this is Eric Barrasso with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Thank you. MBTA Advisory Board. Good morning, Amir Patterson from the MBTA Advisory Board. Thank you. Regional Transportation Advisory Council. Leonard Diggins Advisory Council here, thanks. City of Boston, Boston Transportation Department. Well, I see Bill is just joining us, so I will come back. Um, City of Boston, Boston Planning and Development Agency. Hi, Jim Fitzgerald, BPDA, um, representing Mayor Wu and City of Boston. Thank you. At large city, City of Everett. At large city, City of Newton. David Kosas representing Mayor Ruth Ann Fuller in the City of Newton. Thank you. At large town, Town of Arlington. Daniel Amstutz representing Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy in the Town of Arlington. At large town, Town of Brookline. Heather Hamilton for the Town of Brookline. Thank you. Inner Core Committee, City of Somerville. Uh, Tom Bent, City of Somerville, representing Mayor Katiana Ballantyne in the Inner Core. Thank you. Minuteman Advisory Group on Interlocal Coordination, Town of Acton. Okay, Metro West Regional Collaborative, City of Framingham. Dennis Chambetti, Representative of Mayor Suzuki in the Metro West Region. Thank you. North Shore Task Force, City of Beverly. Good morning, Denise DeChamps, representing Mayor Michael Cahill, City of Beverly and the North Shore Task Force. 
Thank you. Uh, North Suburban Planning Council, Town of Burlington. Thank you. Um, Melissa Tentopoulos representing the North Suburban Planning Council. South Shore Coalition, Town of Rockland. Southwest Advisory Planning Committee, Town of Medway. Steve Pelletier, Town of Medway. Three Rivers Interlocal Council, Town of Norwood, Rudna Ponset River Regional Chamber. Good morning, Tom O'Rourke from the Town of Norwood representing the Trick Sub Region. Thank you. And just quickly, we'll go back to City of Boston, Boston Transportation Department. Bill Conroy representing Mayor Wu in the City of Boston. Thank you. And I believe also Jay is here from Everett. Thanks, Rasheen. I get uh, Jay Monty representing Mayor DeMaria at the City of Everett. Thanks, Jay. Uh, that calls the roll. You forgot to call on our ex officio members. Oh, I am so sorry. No uh, Federal Highway Administration. Good morning, Ken Miller, Federal Highway. Thank you. Thank you. And Federal Transit Administration. Okay, that calls the roll. Thank you, Rajin. Next up is the chair's report. I don't have one, so we'll go directly to the executive director's report. Is taken here? Ah, I am. I was having some technical difficulties when joining. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, great. All right. Um, so hello, everyone. I would like to start with um, just meeting date um, reminders and updates. We discussed a few meetings ago that we would um, change some of the meeting dates in March and April. And so I wanted to just um, remind us all of that. And we will go in and update the MPO calendar and send some follow-up communications with you all to confirm it. Um, but just to remind you, we um, discussed adding a third meeting in March, March 31st. So I would ask that you please hold that time. And that we also move April 7th out to April 14th and April 21st out to April 28th. So both April meetings move out one week. So they'll still be evenly spaced um, two weeks between meetings. Um, there were two reasons why we had discussed that. Um, one was because it did work well with the evolving TIP schedule and our need to engage with you all and with the public. The other reason why we had discussed that is because of the, um, the act that was extending the certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency was set to potentially expire on April 1st. Um, that has been extended to, to July 15th, so that is no longer really a concern um, around the dates. So you can expect the March and April meetings to continue to be virtual unless you hear um, anything otherwise. So, uh, and then we can discuss in person, uh, you know, the in-person and hybrid options again as we get a little bit closer to July. So again, March 31st, April 14th, and April 28th are the next NPO meetings. Um, so then I wanted to um, start to give the board um, some brief updates on where the CTPS, the staff to the NPO strategic planning efforts are um, kind of are going at the moment. Just as a reminder for folks that um, we have a five-year strategic plan for the staff to the Boston Region MPO. I believe Jonathan just put in a link to the summary webpage where you can see um, some quick notes about, you know, a summary about what the um, strategic plan is about. And then also the board has all seen um, a draft, draft sort of living version of the document, um, but it was some time ago. So if you have any questions about that, please reach out. Um, I wanted to update you that we had, or remind you that we have 17 activities that we're actually working on this fiscal year. And we work the strategic plan on the state fiscal year because that is the fiscal year that our budget, our operating budget is aligned to. So that's um, July 1 to June 30th. Um, and I wanted to give you some kind of mid or part, part way through the year updates on what we're doing. Um, and I will not talk about all of them today because it's too much, uh, but I will summarize um, a few based on the focus areas that I've talked about and that you can see on the summary webpage. So today I would, thought I would talk a little bit about the activities within the sector leadership um, focus area and then the programs and services focus area. Um, so very briefly, um, this includes about five activities in the two areas. Under sector leadership, 
Um, I just wanted to highlight for everyone, one of the um, activities under there is related to the new travel demand modeling tools that we've been developing. And you have actually seen progress on that. Uh, Marty Milkovitz has come to the board and talked about the progress. And just to note for everybody that the main goal of this is to meet our needs for the long range transportation planning work so that we can um, look into doing some explorative scenario, scenario planning as part of that process, but also just to inform the usual LRTP work that we do. Um, so that is ongoing, and I think we're in a, a pretty good spot with that. And if the board wants to hear more about where that is um, at some point in the future, we are happy to come talk to the board. Uh, another area that we are um, engaging in is how we can expand our support for the opportunities for staff to um, share knowledge, to gain experience, to sort of meet with their peers, share their expertise through conferences, through panels, through um, authoring um, publications, through making posts and other activities to really kind of get, get our staff out there and engaging even more with their peers um, and all of us learning more from each other. So we've identified a number of different opportunities and we'll continue to work on that throughout this state fiscal year. But what that will do is um, what we find will inform discussions around our operating budget, which we have with the administration and finance committee um, starting around now until the end of the state fiscal year. And then another um, top area of activity around sector leadership is that we're looking at our web presence for the MPO and trying to determine the level of investment that we might need to be able to improve it, update and improve it. Um, the web presence includes websites, it includes the interactive publications that we've created, um, the applications, the various tools and applications that you can engage with and dashboards um, for you know, sharing and looking at data. So there's a lot of different ways in which our web presence um, can be assessed and um, potentially improved. So right now we're working on technical requirements around those improvements, and then we need to figure out the correlating um, level of budget and human effort, whether it be internal or external, to engage in that. And again, that level of effort would be discussed with the ANF committee um, in our upcoming budget conversations. So that's in the sector leadership area. That's how we're trying to um, kind of elevate our ability to be leaders in our sector. Um, then there's a program and services focus area. And in that area, we're really focusing this year on our project management practices. So one of the activities is around organizing and launching a project management working group among staff um, to really share and support um, the evolution of our project management best practices, make consistent expectations and reporting and communication protocols across staff. Um, so the convening date, um, they, the group has been um, identified and they will begin to meet soon and to talk about these topics um, as they relate to all staff. And that group will also inform another activity of ours, which is to continue to um, evolve a project manager's working guide internally, which serves both aspirational as well as learning as well as um, well-established project managers on our staff to again, ground, um, ground everyone's expectations and skills and best practices. Um, but also really to give consistent guidance that allows and empowers staff to build their project management skills. And that of course we hope will lead to much better outcomes in terms of our um, staff satisfaction as well as our work products. So that's my current update on the strategic plan. Um, I would be happy to answer questions if they come up um, after I finish the report, Mr. Chair, or again, we can talk one-on-one. -on -one. I'm meeting with a number of you over the coming weeks um, just to touch base on MPO activities in general. So with that, I'll move to staff updates. Um, Roisin had the um, pleasure of calling the role today, which I just want to highlight that for her, this is her last MPO meeting. So um, feel free to send her, you know, congratulatory and wishing well chats or something like that, just to sort of um, connect with her. This is the last time you'll get to see her live in her current capacity um, at these meetings. So we're all wishing her very well. Um, and then beyond that, we actually have no current jobs posted. We are in the um, kind of the interview process and the final stages for the new tip manager, we hope. Um, as well as in the interview process for um, a GIS analyst, as well as our manager of projects and applications roles. Um, but keep an eye out because we do expect to post more positions soon. And um, one of the, them will also be a communications position as um, you know, Rasheen is moving on to other opportunities. Um, so we have a few outreach and public comment highlights. First of all, the transit working group. There is a coffee chat held on February 28th and it was about electrifying transit fleets. If you'd like to watch that, that is on our YouTube channel. And our guest at that conversation, that coffee chat was um, Zach Agash of RIPTA, the Rhode Island Public Transit Authority. So it was a great conversation, interested in electrifying transit. Please um, go and take a watch of that on YouTube. And then we have two upcoming, topic, uh, up upcoming coffee chats. 
One of them is on March 10th, and that's about human services transportation. And then um, there's one that we haven't announced yet that we're announcing now that's on April 6th about dealing with the challenges of recruiting and retaining drivers. And that coffee chat will be facilitated by an FTA supported transit workforce center. Um, so that would be an interesting conversation as well. Um, as always, um, hopefully we are putting some links for registrations for those in the chat and you can check out our transit working group webpage and or always please feel free to reach out to Sandy Johnston directly if you have any questions want to be put on the mailing list. Um, another um, kind of outreach area, um, more on the topic of our effort to expand how we are communicating and outreach and doing our outreach capacity um, and also elevate the work that the board does. Um, we have been contacted by a journalist at the Engineering News Record to, uh, about a feature on trends in planning and infrastructure. So when we, we discuss topics such as, um, well, we focused in on the MPO's tip criteria scoring process, so the update to it, and the focused on resiliency and, and equity goals. So that was the main area of, of conversation. And so um, if we do have a feature come out about that, it should come out sometime in the next few weeks. And we'd love to highlight that for the board so that you all can take a look um, at that highlight of your, your very hard work with, with staff as well. Um, so then for today, we have no action items other than approval of the minutes, but we do have two um, important presentations. One is on identifying the transportation equities in the Boston region study. Um, and then also we will be discussing the evaluation scores for projects being considered for programming in the next transportation improvement program or TIF. Um, and in, that includes the community connections programs that are being evaluated. So that would be the bulk of the meeting today. And then at the next meeting, um, we may ask you to approve work scopes, um, a work scope on the Blue Hills, um, equity and access in the Blue Hills work scope, and also um, approval of the transit management transit asset management targets for state fiscal year 22. Um, and then we will also likely come to you with the preliminary programming scenarios for TIP projects for the next TIP cycle. And that, Mr. Chair, is it. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Tegan. Any questions from the members for Tegan? Seeing none. Uh, the next item on the agenda is public comments. Is there anyone from the public who would like to comment at this time? If so, please raise your hand and we will call on you. Erin Wortman. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair, um, for recognizing me. Um, I will make this quick. I know you have a very long agenda, but for the record, my name is Erin Wortman. I'm from the town of Stoneham. Uh, I am the uh, Director of Planning and Community Development for the town. Um, I want to thank the MPO for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I am here before you to kind of plug and uh, really highlight our Community Connections, the Stoneham Community Connection Grant um, application, which you'll hear about later today. Um, I first want to thank Sandy and Matt um, from CTPS staff for being true ambassadors for the program. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations over the last uh, probably a couple years now to talk about this project. And uh, we're really just looking to kind of address three major points. Uh, we want to address first and last mile connections for our residents, our businesses, um, and really the subregion. We're trying to build capacity into our, um, the existing MBTA service. We have one uh, true MBTA bus line that runs north to south, south to north, up and down Main Street, but there are no east-west connections and it becomes really challenging for people to kind of get around uh, without going north and south. And third, we're just trying to enhance uh, transportation equity throughout the area. I think that's something we all seek to do in all our work, we find it really important. And um, again, I wanna thank you uh, for the opportunity to kind of speak during this time. And um, I know you have a lot of work and really hard conversations uh, to determine funding. And I really appreciate um, your thoughtfulness and your consideration on our project. So thank you. Thank you. Next public comment is from Jeffrey Roth. And please state your name for the record, even though I already have. Yeah, hi, uh, my, my name is Jeff Roth. Uh, Wait, we lost your volume. We can't hear you, Jeff. We heard you, now you're good. Okay, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Well, well, thanks a lot for um, considering our community connections uh, project. Uh, my name is Jeff Roth. I'm 
uh, representing uh, Belmont. Um, and the project that we have is to provide a bike shelter over one of the bike racks at the Belmont Chenery Medical Middle School. Um, and this large school currently has no covered areas for students to park uh, bikes at. And while this is a, a pretty small project relative to a lot of the other projects that you have in your in your uh, program, uh, we feel this this can have a really huge impact uh, as it could promote the town to invest further in covered bike parking at the schools. And uh, covered bike parking um, studies have shown that it has two times more likely uh, to be used in uncovered bike parking. And that's uh, you know, a reason that's part of the community connections program. And we, we think it can really help to encourage the mode share shifts uh, towards cycling in Belmont. And the unique thing about our project is that it provides a way to encourage uh, more, more biking to our town's middle school. Um, and while the community connection scoring rubric uh, is generally geared more towards adults, um, I just wanna emphasize that these are middle school kids uh, coming from their homes, uh, not really from Alewife or other transit hubs. And so I think that's kind of reflected a little bit in the scoring. And so I wanted to point that out uh, because at the same time, uh, Belmont is a very dense town and there is a huge untapped potential to get more people to bike since things are so close together. And as evidence for this, we've seen an explosive growth in kids bike at the Belmont High School, uh, which was just rebuilt this past year, uh, which has uh, an area for covered bike parking that's for more than about hundred plus bikes. And another, another point I wanted to make was regarding the transportation equity scoring assessment. Uh, many projects serve mixed demographics and are not exclusive to equity populations. Uh, however, this project is unique in that it nearly exclusively serves the youth equity demographic population. Uh, and kids are a largely underrepresented population in transportation systems, I think, as we all realize, uh, because they're mostly geared towards adults. And furthermore, a big part of this project is to develop sustainable, healthy patterns in middle school kids to encourage them to bike and walk to school. And if they develop these habits and skills at this age, then we feel like they'll carry them on into adulthood. Uh, I wanted to mention that our team is due to this progress, um, working with some people at the middle school. And I'd like to know if, if additional support letters are helpful before the March 17th meeting, and if there's anything else we can do to boost our project score. Uh, and if there's some minimum score we need to achieve in order to be successful with this uh, funding application. Uh, on a related topic, I wanna close by just also speaking briefly about the Belmont Community Path and voicing my strong support for that critical project uh, for getting MPO funding this year. Uh, this is a really critical link for the Mass Central Rail Trail and it will have huge ecological, economic and health benefits for uh, the greater Boston time. So thank you very much for a uh, very bitter Boston area. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Before I call our, ne our next speaker, Lynn, do you have a question for Mr. Roth? If not, I'll call on you after I've called on other speakers. Do you have a question actually, I do. actually, I do, Mr. Chair. You know, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, so, Mr. Roth, I mean, I'm definitely inclined to believe me you know, that a people who start using transit earlier and life continue to do so. Um, but, but if you have any evidence of that, I'm not trying to put you on the spot now at all. But if you have, be, please send that along to me. I mean, I'll do some research myself, but I'd love to be able to um, back that up with some, some real data I mean, when I make my case. So, so thank you very much. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to touch base. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks. So, Mr. Chair, thank you. You're welcome, Lynn. Next is Valerie Gingrich. And again, please state your name for the record. Good morning, Valerie Gingrich. I'm the Director of Planning and Conservation for the Town of Wilmington. I'm here to speak about the cost increases associated with the Lowell Street, Woburn Street intersection improvement project that's programmed for 2023. Um, it's one of the three projects that was flagged um, as cost increase over 25%. So at the 25% um, design, the project costs were estimated at 4.7 million. And at the 75% design, the costs are now estimated to be 6.4 million, an increase of 35% about uh, $1.7 million. So I wanted to go over the factors that played into that cost increase for the board. Um, first, uh, utility relocation costs were substantially higher than projected, increasing from a placeholder of 330,000 in the 25% design to 867,000 for the actual cost based on the force accounts that we received from MassDOT. And that's reflected in the 75% design. Um, so that would that would account for about a third or 30% of the cost increase. Um, second, uh, between the 25% design and the 75% design, 
um, stormwater management BMPs were refined and we got more accurate earthwork volumes for the drainage swale and infiltration basin design. Also the lane expansions and resulting increase in impervious area, um, the hydraulic analysis done for that revealed that the existing drain system in Lowell Street was surcharged. So pipe sizes needed to be increased to facilitate the project. These items, these stormwater items together totaled um, just over $700,000. So that's about 42% of that $1.7 million cost increase. Um, third, the unit price increases account for about 15% of the cost increase, uh, 263,000. And then finally, in addressing MassDOT comments and applying the escalator, um, it kind of rounds out that 35% increase in cost. So in summary, we've had um, some cost increases due to rising utility prices, addressing stormwater management issues, but we feel that the overall scope of the project has not changed. And we're working on the 100% design, which is expected to be submitted before the end of May. And we truly appreciate the MPO's consideration of funding the cost increase for the Woburn and Lowell Street intersection project. It's a, it's a very important project in terms of safety since it currently operates with pedestal lights and it's a high crash intersection. And uh, it'll see additional traffic when the new Boston Street Bridge is opened in Woburn. So um, we'd be happy to take any questions from the board back to our consultants at TEC so they can address them at the next meeting if you'd like. And I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Gingrich. Next up is Sophia Gallimore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm here, my name again is Sophia Gallimore and I'm here to represent the Watertown Transportation Management Association and the city of Watertown um, for the uh, grant application that we submitted. We currently do have, we were able to um, implement our one shuttle service on the Pleasant Street corridor. And so this grant we are requesting to replace that one shuttle um, S power bus with two electric vehicles. And this is part of, um, of the Watertown Comprehensive Plan and their climate change in this initiative to move forward with electrification, as well as with the addition of another vehicle, it will shorten the headways from um, one hour to a half an hour. Uh, and this we do know would increase ridership. So I'm here today to you know, answer any questions uh, that the board may have as we go through um, the application process or the scoring process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gallimore. Next up is Rich Benevento from World Tech. Neat. Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, just wanted, I mentioned this at the last meeting, but uh, seeing as now, uh, we're talking a little bit about um, project increases. Uh, uh, Bridge Street in Beverly was obviously flagged as a project that had exceeded the original um, MPO programmed amount. Uh, I'm not going to get on, into all of the details as because I think Valerie just did a great job in describing just some of the things that we've been facing. And I know uh, that Eric Barasa and the subcommittee had been talking about project increases and why. Um, one of the things that we've talked about in the past that you know, when we're putting a funding request in through the PIF process, um, really those are sort of order of magnitude numbers. Uh, we're looking at linear foot costs, we're looking at major items, uh, but really it's, uh, we're pretty much throwing a dart at the wall uh, and trying to figure out what the cost of a particular project might be. Uh, when we get to the 25% design, obviously that, uh, that estimate is refined further uh, because we have on the ground survey and we're looking at other things. Uh, and then, of course, when we get to the 75% design phase, we really have a good idea of, of, of what the costs are going to be. Um, and we've talked about, you know, the 4% inflation factor that Federal Highway recommends. Uh, but we've also had extensive discussions that uh, costs are just up. Steel, concrete, asphalt. Uh, and so they're really driving the cost up. And then on top of it, uh, there's that um, and what we've been using is that 30% additional cost at the end of the project for all of the add-ons, utility relocations, police, construction engineering, and so on and so forth. 
I think the big factor here is this was the project increase in cost was not due to scope creep. And I think that's one of the things that the MPO is always uh, very cognizant of and very mindful of that, uh, you know, projects are, you know, it was supposed to go from A to Z, or excuse me, A to B, and we're already down to A to Z, you know, we, we've added streets and everything else. So I, I think the important thing to note, and I think Valerie even said it uh, on her project, that um, the Beverly project was not due to scope creep, it's just due to the uh, what we're facing these days. So I just wanted to make that comment. I know uh, also on the call this morning is uh, the Commissioner of Public Works, Mike Collins, and also City Engineer um, uh, Eric Barber. So uh, if uh, there's any questions from the board about it, but I think we're going to continue to see this. I think we need to be, be doing a better job uh, collectively uh, when we're requesting uh, funding for a project and really adding these costs in and being, uh, you know, a little bit more cognizant of, you know, adding what these inflation costs are and really the the uh, the designers knowing that at the end of the job if a, if a project's being programmed for five million dollars it needs to be 30 percent less than that because at the end of the job we have to add in all of those additional costs that um, that mass dot is going to need to administer the project so anyway kind of long-winded this morning but if there's any additional questions happy to answer them uh, but did want to give you an update on beverly thank you any other comments at this time Seeing none, if you have any comments during the meeting, please raise your hand and we will call on you. Next up is the committee's chair's report. Are there any? Derek Cravat. Yes, thank you. Um, Derek Cravat, chair of the UPWP committee. Um, the UPWP committee did meet this morning. The two main agenda items were a discussion of the federal fiscal year 2023 UPWP development schedule and a presentation on proposed changes to the UPWP budgeting process. Uh, there were some good uh, ideas thrown around for new UPWP tasks, as well as some discussion on the uh, proposed budgeting changes. Um, by the time of the next meeting, which will be either March 31st or April 14th, and we'll coordinate on the exact date and let folks know, um, we will uh, by, by then have results from the survey that's been put out uh, soliciting ideas for new UPWP tasks. So at that meeting, we'll be able to review the universe of proposed studies for the 2023 UPWP uh, and being in the process of selecting those studies for, for programming. Uh, there will also be an update on the budgeting changes we discussed this morning uh, after CTPS and OTP coordinate a bit more on that between now and then. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Derek. Questions for Derek? Seeing none, I just would like to note for the record that this morning I got a letter of support from Representative Sally Karens for a particular UPW, UPWP project, and I have made that available to MPO staff. Next item on any other committee chairs reports? Seeing none, next item on the agenda is Regional Transportation Advisory Council report. Lynn? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, since we have not had a meeting since our last MPO meeting, I don't have anything to report from um, um, the council um, respect to the past, but uh, concerning the future, uh, we are going to have Sandy uh, talk with us about freight at our meeting next next Wednesday, uh, and Matt will be talking with us uh, about the tip universe, presumably. So even though these are in-house regulars, we, uh, their visits to the um, council always are interesting and we are able to go more in-depth, so I encourage people to attend. And since I don't have much to say today, I'll just end with a compliment. You're looking very dapper today, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate it. Okay. Next, next item on the agenda is the approval of the NPO minutes of January 20th. Can I get a motion and a second? And please state your name for the record when making the motion. Is there a motion to approve? Eric Barassa. Uh, Eric Barassa, I make a motion to approve uh, these minutes. Tom O'Rourke. I will second that motion. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Any comments, changes, questions, or suggestions? JDO, seeing none, please call the roll, Jonathan. Not that chair. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Regine, please call the roll. Yes. Uh, Mass dot C2. John Bouchard, yes. Mass dot Highway Division. John Romano, yes. MBTA. Jillian Linnell, yes. 
MAPC? Eric Barassa, yes. MBTA Advisory Board? MBTA Advisory Board, yes. Regional Transportation Advisory Council? Yes. City of Boston, Boston Transportation Department? Bill Conroy, yes. City of Boston, BPDA? Jim Fitzgerald, yes. At large, City of Everett? Jim Monty, yes. At large, City of Newton? David Tosis, yes. At large, Town of Arlington? Daniel Amstutz, yes. At large, Town of Brookline. Heather Hamilton, yes. Inner Core, City of Somerville. Uh, Tom Benton, yes. Metro West, City of Framingham. Dennis Giovanni abstains. North Shore, City of Beverly. Denise DeChamps abstains. North Suburban, Town of Burlington. Melissa Tentopoulos, yes. South Shore, Town of Rockland. And Constable, yes. Swap, Town of Medway. Having some issues unmuting here, so maybe circle back. Okay, uh, Trick, Town of Norwood. Town of Rook, yes. Okay, uh, that motion carries. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is identifying transportation equity inequities in the Boston region study update. Betsy Harvey, when you're ready, Betsy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to give an update today on the study identifying transportation inequities in the Boston region that this board approved back in November. And specifically, I want to focus on the metrics that we intend to analyze um, kind of going forward for throughout the rest of the study. And at the end of the presentation, I'm interested in hearing from the board if there are any metrics that you think we could add or any comments or suggestions about the study approach as we are moving to that phase um, in, the, in the coming days. So just as a reminder, the study goal is to develop a baseline assessment of existing transportation inequities in the Boston region uh, for environmental justice populations. And the intention is that the results of the study can provide the board with more information on the equity impacts of investment decisions. Um, and because this work is not tied to federal requirements, it is up to MPO and the staff to decide which metrics to develop and how they will be applied to the MPO's work. The final product will certainly provide those recommendations for doing so, but I wanted to flag that now as something for, for you all to think about. And as I hope you'll see as I continue the presentation, the work could be used to support different MPO programs, including the LRTP disparate impact and disproportionate burden analysis by providing a baseline for the metrics that we include in that analysis. Because if you remember, the disparate impact metrics only look at possible future inequities, not existing inequities. The work could also inform equity criteria for TIP project selection. It could inform the EJ analysis that is completed for projects in the TIP each year. And it could also inform performance-based planning. So this slide shows our study approach, and it's I think it's worth kind of kind of going through that a little bit because it's a little bit different from what we often do for our studies. 
So in the first part, we're kind of working right now on finishing up, or we finished a literature review of what other MPOs have looked at for their own equity metrics. We've coordinated with folks at MAPC and MassDOT on our work, and we've been talking with advocates and other interested parties on the sorts of metrics that they'd like to see us analyze. Um, after today, we're going to move ahead with that middle part of the, the flow chart, which is uh, analyzing the metrics, which I will describe the metrics a little bit more in the next slide. Um, and I want to note that our public outreach is ongoing, and we do anticipate that continuing over the next month or so, because the analyses we're conducted, conducting are pretty iterative, and we may choose to change some of the metrics based on what we're finding and what we're hearing. Um, so, and I want to explain kind of why that's the case. It's a little bit different from what we might normally do. And one reason is that this is the first time this MPO is developing metrics to exist, to address existing uh, transportation inequities. So we really kind of are developing these metrics from the ground up. And so we're not 100% sure like what we're going to find as we develop that methodology. And second, as you'll see in a moment, we are focusing on destination access metrics. And in doing so, we are going to be using for the first time a new tool at the MPO uh, called Conveil. So as we work out that process for using Conveil, we do need some freedom to be iterative. We are gonna be starting with metrics that we think are a little bit easier to analyze and that we're more familiar with because we've worked with them in some other capacity. And as we establish a methodology and see how much work it takes to analyze each metric and the data we need, we'll be able to determine if we should add more metrics or make any changes to the ones we have. And the final report will document all this so that staff and the MPO can make informed decisions about next steps. So these are the proposed metrics that we wanna start with. Um, you may see that they are familiar because they do are fairly similar to the ones that we've looked at in our disparate impact analysis for the long range plan. Um, they include access to destinations by various travel modes, including jobs, healthcare, education, and essential services. And then we have a couple of metrics that we kind of view as experimental, and we're gonna explore the feasibility of these metrics and report in our findings in the report in the final product. These are looking at household or person transportation costs for different modes and also travel times for various modes. And um, we are going to focus initially on those access to destination metrics because they are part of the long range plan disparate impact analysis. And that decision to include them was deliberate um, and motivated in fact by the feedback that we did hear from our stakeholder working group back in 2018 about wanting to understand where there are existing inequities for these metrics. And I hope that by analyzing these, we'll be able to provide better context for the disparate impact analysis, which will be conducted again soon for the 2023 long range plan. But again, I wanna kind of emphasize that these are what we're gonna start with and we may end up kind of making revisions along the way, depending on our, how our process plays out and what we're hearing from public outreach. So, I want to talk a little bit about what Conveil is because I'm not, I don't think this has really been covered um, in this space. Um, we recently got access to this program, Conveil, which is a destination access tool. And simply put, it is a online platform for analyzing access to any destination of, of your choice in the region. It includes multimodal transportation, so you can analyze access by walking, biking, drive, driving, or transit, although transit is kind of the most robust analysis. You can build detailed transportation scenarios, you can add or remove various infrastructure and compare the impacts of those changes. You can also do a regional analysis, for example, looking at how many jobs people in our region have access to within a given travel time or you can do a single point analysis, which analyzes, for example, how many jobs people in Union Square have access to. And critically for this study, you can assess the impacts on different demographic groups. So finally, I wanna to touch on some things that we've been hearing and thinking about as we've been doing our literature review and outreach conversations. 
So these are sorts of things that might need more work and to get the data for and develop methodology for, but we are building this kind of bucket of things to keep in mind as possible additions, whether in the study or in future work. We are documenting what we hear, what we hear, and we'll be adding these to the bucket with the intention of exploring in further follow up and possibly adding them to baseline metrics in the future. These include things like connectivity to transit providers, the effects of climate change on destination access, impacts of cost of transportation on access, access to night shift jobs, and comparing access before and during the pandemic. So in closing, I want to emphasize that I don't anticipate this work of developing baseline metrics to necessarily stop with the study. This is our first, for, first foray in developing these metrics and a methodology. And we may find that we want to revise some of these that we, that we do choose um, going forward. But regardless of the outcome, we will have learned a lot about how we use Conveil and what we could do, for, do going forward to integrate these analyses into other MPO programs and whether we want to pursue creating a consistent, consistent set of equity metrics that we regularly update to assess MPO's progress in meeting its equity goal and objectives. So I just have a couple of discussion questions that for you to think about if you'd like to address them now or, or take time to think about them um, later, that's okay too. Um, are there additional metrics we should explore? Do you have any thoughts about how you'd like to see the final results presented in terms of the format? Um, or are there other ways that you envision we could use the study results that I haven't mentioned? And of course, if you have any other comments or suggestions or questions, I'm happy to hear those too. So thank you, and I'm happy to, to have a discussion. Thank you, Betsy. Comments, questions from the members? Lynn Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so um, to answer the third point here, um, and along with one of your fabulous presentations and to the board, a you know, uh, uh, memo would be great, maybe something that I could refer to um, later on, you know, um, I guess you could also give us you know, the, a PDF of the PowerPoint, but the memos that the um, staff creates are, I think, really good and useful as a reference. So that would be a request uh, for uh, respect to that point. Um, if you could maybe back up a couple, one slide maybe, and then maybe another one. So um, this, the, the third one, um, impact on cost of access, keep that in mind and then back up another one, please. Uh, another one, please. Okay, so on the exploratory metrics, I'm especially interested in the household or person transportation costs for different modes. And maybe I'm a little off base here, but I'll tell you why. And that is when we often do, or the MBTA does uh, impact, um, analysis of fare increases. One of my concerns early on was that, well, people may continue using the T, whatever mode, um, when the fares go up, but what is it that they are giving up in order to do that? I mean, if they are really have very low income and they have to get to point A, point B, I mean, what are they not spending on that they would also need to spend on food, medication, or whatever? So, with that, exploratory metric get at that? Um, and does that kind of relate to what I asked you to show me earlier about the, um, the impact of costs? That, it, it, the trade-off is difficult because everybody is going to have their own trade-offs, right? Yeah. I, think, I think because it is a regional, we're kind of doing a regional analysis to look on average, what are people spending? Um, it probably wouldn't get to that level of detail, but okay. we can certainly assume, you know, if, if costs do go up, that people do have to make those trade-offs, and that probably would end up being a pretty individual choice. Okay, so then, so then, um, I guess, so that metric wouldn't study that, the exploratory one. It would probably, we're going to try to look at what are transportation costs by different travel modes, right, and also try to integrate uh, look at it from different demographic perspectives as well. 
Okay. Um, there's a lot of information, and but there's also it's also very tricky because each region kind of has its own cost of living, and there are a lot of variables, which is why we kind of put it into the exploratory gotcha. uh, category. So we'll, as we work through it, we can we'll refine kind of what the question is specifically that we're trying to ask based on the data that we have available. And you know, we may end up maybe ha have kind of dip, several different kind of lenses or ways to look at yeah. travel costs, but we can certainly keep you updated on that if that's something you're interested in hearing more I got about. It. So, to, so then could we come back forward a couple of slides just to make sure I understand me yeah. what we're getting at. So this one, so the impact of cost on access, that's just really, can they afford the, continue using the system when the costs go up yeah so okay, right. so that's more about the access that's like if it's kind of like if you remember from statistics like um your know, price elasticity if if right. prices go up then does ridership then how does that change okay. um people's and then their ability to get to where they need to go if they can no longer pay those costs so that's gotcha. kind of like after you know how much things cost for people then like right. how does that affect their behavior right well as i say often i'm really proud of the MPO for doing this kind of research and just constantly doing it and constantly figuring out how to do it better. So thank you. Thank you. Eric. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I would echo just uh, a little bit of what, what Len said about, uh, I, I too am very interested in kind of the role or, or any light that we can, you know, shed on the role of, um, you know, cost on uh, people's access to things. There's obviously a big debate, you know, unfolding in the region about the cost of of, of fares on low income people and, and buses and things like that. So I, I'm not saying this is directly related to that, but I think anything that, that we can do to try to better understand the relationship between like sort of cost and, um, and, and, and particularly, you know, like def like really trying to think about what is that like what is that right metric for understanding that I I, I think is great. Um, my question, Betsy, is is the product of this work like will it be like a like a spatial product where we will see actual places in the region where there are sort of identified inequities based on those these metrics, or is it going to be more like here are you know, here are the the types of metric. Like, how will the, how will the 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 results be, um, you know, provided? I'm just curious about that. So we're still kind of figuring that out a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to be able to say, you know, say like this is these are this is how much jobs, for example, people have access to in the region, right? Um, you know, there may well be visuals. You know, conveil as you kind of saw in that image is a pretty visual. It's a you know, it's a visual spatial tool. So you can get that, you can show some of that information visually. So there may be, so I'd like to also include some visual elements in some way um, and be kind of transparent too on the methodology so folks can really see and dig into how we did this. Um, so that's been, part of it's gonna depend on how we, how Conveil ends up kind of working for yeah. us. Um, but certainly if, if that's something, that's why I'm kind of asking the question, like if people are really interested in having a visual, really visual element, then we can try to figure out a way to work that in. I mean, to me, I, I feel like so much of what we do at the MPO, you know, is about, you know, pro, you know, uh, deciding how we spend, you know, these, these transportation dollars on, you know, projects at the, you know, at the, at the, at the corridor level, you know, and so I think to the extent that there could be a spatial element that helps us understand, like, like, you know, when we're talking about these different metrics and these, these tra transportation, you know, inequities, is there, you know, is there a way to sort of identify where, where in the region some are, are greater than others or anything like that, I think would, would be, would be helpful. I know that's sometimes that's challenging, you know, when we, you know, how the, the research is done, but um, I, I think that would be useful for the MPO to, to be able to see that. Um, and I think that would help us, you know, with the various, um, you know, planning, you know, things that you identified, the long range plan, the TIP, the UPWP, you know, the, our, our, the, the, the criteria for scoring projects. I think it, it could help inform all of, all of those things. Okay, thank you. Betsy, I have a question about um, access to jobs. Let's just use that one. So earlier you said how many jobs are, are within say 45 minutes of Union Square, right? Will you be setting the same um, time 
time limitation on both transit and highway. So it's 45 minutes regardless of mode, or are you going to have a, how many jobs can you reach within 45 minutes in your car and how many jobs can you reach within half an hour on transit? Like how, how do you make those distinctions and how do you, how do you know you've set the right time parameter? That's a really good question. And we are, haven't made that decision yet. Um, it, it is, uh, you know, you can use the average, for example, as one way to think about it for each mode, and then it would end up being different, of course, um, you know, the average in the region. Um, uh, transit trips are generally longer, so it's kind of, you know, you want to think about that as well. And, and obviously, like walking and biking trips are usually pretty sh or shorter. So, you know, there's a couple of things to weigh, but we haven't quite decided on what our thresholds will be. Okay. And then one other thing. Um, so explain to me, like, how, do, how does geography work in this? Because depending on where you live in this, in this region, you have access to very few jobs by transit. But that's a function of, of, of you've, you've, you've chosen to locate yourself in a community that doesn't, that's not within the MBTA, MBTA area. So how, how, do, how do you make sure you're not unintentionally biasing results to show that, that you know, middle class, upper class people don't have access to transit? Like, I'm not sure I care. So, so, so how do you, you know, you know what I'm asking? Mm -hmm. One way we could do, as you know, Eric kind of alluded to, is looking at different geographies. We have kind of tossed around that idea too of looking at kind of sub areas of kind of you know inner core or, or, or other transit rich areas versus areas that have less um, transit access. Um, the other thing to think about too is that in the sense of having metrics that offer or serve as a baseline to the disparate impact metrics for a long range plan that those have to be at a regional level. And so there is value in, in having um, a comparable metric that also looks at it as a re from a regional level so that we have, we're kind of able to compare apples to apples and saying this is our baseline as a region, this is our baseline to, you know, and then can be able to compare that to, to what we see in our disparate impact metrics, which looks into the future to our, to our outer year of the plan. Um, so there are, yeah, there are definitely some ways we can think about kind of how can we reflect the, the reality of what people are, are living, but also I think more specifically to this project too, is we're not just looking at as a region, we're also looking at people where people who's are looking at environmental justice communities and folks who identify as people of color or have lower incomes. And so that distinction, you know, what we want to be able to do is to say like, which these populations have equitable access regardless of where they live are they do they have equitable access to these destinations compared to non-aj populations so there are a lot of different kind of pieces we can kind of pull at and i think part of this will be you know within our budget what do we want to focus on the ej component certainly and kind of you know think about to your point of like how do we uh kind of get at the, the intricacies of our region at a more maybe perhaps at a more sub-regional level yeah, and then I'm gonna ask one more question and then I'm, I'll be done. The, the other thing is, is I would encourage you to think about how you get at people's lived experiences, right? As uh, data is really important and data is very valuable, but sometimes it's not just how long does it take you to get to work on, on, on the transit system, but how difficult is it, right? Do, are you making two transfers and therefore you're taking three trips that are linked together as opposed to somebody else who just gets on, you know, the green line and they get on it where they live and they get off where they work. So, so I just encourage you to think about how to not just rely on data, but, but think about that issue. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Ken? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, uh, two questions, Betsy. One relates to how the conveyor model handles uh, access to a vehicle uh, very often access, uh, particularly if you live in an area that doesn't have good transit access, your access is determined whether you have access to a private vehicle. Uh, and then also, you know, in relation to that, also how does a uh, transportation service providers like Uber and Lyft providing access? Uh, that's one question. And my second um, question relates to cost. When you're talking about cost in the model, is it solely 
uh, cash or is it uh, actually to get to David's question, is it also travel time? Because typically in most modeling, you know, you use a measure of something called impedance, which is some combination of cost and time and that kind of thing. So uh, number of transfers, et cetera. So can you, uh, have you have enough experience in the model yet to be able to answer either of those questions? Or, or, I will try. I will try. And then if Emily DeMonico, I know she's here, um, is doing the actual analysis work, if you want to jump in as well, um, that would be helpful. I don't believe that the conveyal addresses contains a cost element um, as in the same way that our travel to man model does. So there's definitely a distinction in terms of how the two different one, the two, um, the, the two analysis tools work. Um, and nor what was the other one? Oh, uh, household vehicle ownership. I also don't think that those are part of the of Conveil either. Um, Emily, do you have anything else you want to add or different? Sure. Like, no different um, so those are all very good points to like consider. And we're at the point where we're trying to figure out what we can rope in reliably to the analysis and generate meaningful results. So they're, they're good points to touch on. Um, and they are kind of Conveil will do access uh, to certain destinations. You have a destination count and you have time and you have detail of how Conveil thinks they get there. Um, from there, we can use all of those results to assign costs of travel. We might have to make some assumptions and it, then it's matching up the data of what we have external to Conveil to what can fit with Conveil and that we're, we're still exploring but uh, pulling in avail available vehicles at the household level from the census would be an option. I don't know how reliably those fit together yet. But there's all there's a bunch of things that we can consider in, in addition to what we're pulling out of Conveil, um, but Conveil's strength is really the, the time it takes to route to a destination and the number of destinations you can access in a certain amount of time. Um, Great. If I may, Mr. Chair, just to follow up. I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's great. I guess, you know, there's, there's a distinction to be made between people who choose to live in a place where they have good access to transit and therefore don't need a, a vehicle and, and people who can't afford mm -hmm. to have access to a vehicle. Uh, so I think that's an important distinction. Too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, and, and Ken was getting at what I was going to say, because I know you know this, Mr. Chair, that is that I mean, people sometimes don't have the, the ability to live close in to transit, being in, in fact, a lot of times we, we places with good transit gets priced out of um, people's um, affordability range. And so, so they, in order to live I mean, someplace, I mean, it's not particularly good for transit or even particularly dense enough to have the jobs that they need to go to. So I used to be a big fan of, of distance-based pricing, but it has become um, for transit, but it's become more and more apparent you know, that people have to live further out you know, of the core you know, in order to just be able to afford to live. I'm a little less um, positive about um, distance-based transit um, 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 costs, distance-based pricing. Uh, and with respect to um, your comment about uh, reliance on data in a difficulty, you know, being, we need to take that into account. I mean, it's all data. I mean, it's just a matter of how easy it is to measure it. I mean, and so I think what you mean by data is like, we have some metrics that are easy to measure, I mean, but I mean, the difficulty in, in getting I mean, the number of transfers or whatever, it's just hard to measure. But it's still it's still data, and so if we want to take that into account, we have to figure out how to measure it. And I say that because I was at a meeting me for um, the the T's plan to do some fare reduction, and folks were saying, "Well, you know, you you you, you do this data, but you really need to take into account how people feel about things." Once again, me that's data. Me, it's just hard to measure. But if we get to the point where we're saying to people, we don't want you necessarily to measure me, how have some consistent way of measuring things. I mean, then that quickly becomes a way of, of uh, getting into a system where me, it's how people feel about things, people in, in power um, feel about things that then determine what happens as opposed to us having a consistent way of making decisions about how we uh, uh, having a consistent way of making decisions. 
Thank you. Yep. Daniel. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I, Mitt Len basically uh, said most of what I wanted to say in regards to um, the cost of living and the certainly in this region, the difficulty or the higher cost of housing near transit um, in the inner core um, and how that relates to, like we were just talking about, where people quote unquote choose to live. Um, the only thing I'd add to that, so just to, to again support what Len was saying, but just to add um, you know, I don't know if there's there's any way to include some degree of cost of living as compared to cost of transportation. Um, I know you know there's different metrics around how much you ought to be spending on cost of housing versus how much you ought to be spending on transportation or, or just sort of the general like what's affordable. Um, yeah, maybe some degree of affordability could be incorporated, but um, you know, that might really complicate things. So anyway, if, if you know, if you sort of go down that road, um, is there some way to measure that too? Okay, so just to be clear, the road I wanna go down is a, a person who lives in a, in a Tony suburb and complains that they don't have access to transit is not getting inequitable treatment because they don't have access to transit. They've made a life choice that they have ability to make, and they are not an equity population, regardless of whether they have access to transit or not. That's the only point I'm trying to make. There's a whole host of people, look at a map. There's a whole host of people who live in, 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 in nothing but, but upper class white communities by choice. Those people are, whether they have access to transit or not is not an equity issue. I just wanna make sure we don't accidentally identify some transit deserts that are actually, you know what? It's not a transit desert. People have opted to live there and they opted to live there without transit. If you, if you want to get at equity, you need to be careful and make sure that you're measuring transit service to populations that are traditionally treated inequitably. That, that, that was the only point I was trying to make. Eric? Yeah, uh, David, I support that. Um, I, I, I agree that I think like this work should really, you know, try to distinguish, you know, like when we talk about equity, what are the equity populations? And, and, I, and I think we've, I think Betsy and her team has done a pretty good job, like over the years of, of how we, how we define that. Um, and I, I think that point you made is, is, is an important one of, of making sure that we don't just do something that, that is so, um, you know, is the like the scope is so large that at the end of it we don't actually have a clear picture that it's like there's inequity everywhere and 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 we we're not kind of being clear about like what we mean by by equity. So um, I I would agree with that point, David. I just want to cl clarify that I, I do think we're on the same page that we are going to be looking at specifically environmental justice populations and their access to low income populations, people which we define as two hundred percent of the poverty level and people of color. And so we will be looking at their access compared to people who don't qualify as equity populations or as EJ populations. So that will be that, that is our priority. Thank you, Betsy. Lynn, you wanna have the last comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see uh, the forceful response um, from you. And, and I understand where we're going with the equity thing, but I, I will say that, that we, I think, Wealthy people, you know, um, they deserve good transit too. You know, and and so we need to figure out a way to get everyone transit, especially you know the kids, you know, of, of people who live, you know, in um, well-to-do places who you know, want transit. So this is just an aside, and that is the last comment. Thank you. Yeah, I, I will just quietly disagree with you, Lynn. Right. Next item on the agenda is the. Thank you, Betsy, very much. You too, Emily. Next, part, next uh, issue on the agenda is the FF23 to 27 Transportation Improvement Program Project Scoring Results. Matt Genova. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning still, everyone. Um, glad to see the good discussion on that last topic. Matt, uh, before you go, let me ask you a question, Matt. Since, since I think you're going to go over individual projects, do you want to take questions as you go? Or do you want us to hold all questions till the end? Sure, totally your choice. I don't care what the answer is. 
Yeah, uh, thanks for asking up front. Uh, I think we could probably just hold questions to the end and then I'm happy, you know, if folks okay. want to go back to a certain slide, happy to scroll back. All right, excellent. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as, as the chair noted today, I will be discussing the scoring results for new projects being considered for funding this year in the federal fiscal years 2023 through 2027 transportation improvement program. So we do have a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, so thank you in advance for bearing with me. Um, but hopefully this is, is a fruitful discussion and sets us up well for the, the coming MPO meetings. So this is the ground that we'll cover in the coming slides. I'll start by highlighting the key role, uh, the key goals rather for today's conversation. And then we'll follow with a quick reminder of where we are on this year's TIP development timeline. I'll take a few minutes to review the written public comments that have been submitted to this board since the last time the MPO met on February 17th. And then from there, I'll dive into the main portion of the presentation, which is an overview of the scoring results for all of the projects being considered for TIP funding this year. Uh, in closing, I'll touch on a handful of next steps before opening things up for discussion. Uh, and as we just, dis just discussed, if you have questions on specific projects, happy to take them at that time and uh, scroll around as needed. Um, so I do want to point you all to a couple of resources that have been posted to the MPO's meeting calendar under today's date, uh, which should be um, available for you and, and will be handy to have you pulled up um, while we're going through the presentation. Um, so available for your review are two items. Uh, first, a compilation of the written public comments that have been submitted to the MPO over the last couple of weeks. And then second, a packet containing one-page project summaries of every project that is under consideration for funding this year along with a one-page scoring summary of each of those projects. So you'll see those in sequence, go sort of project summary, scoring summary for each project, all the way through uh, the 25 projects that we're looking at this year. To set up today's discussion, I do wanna highlight um, at the outset, the two main goals that we have for the dialogue today. Um, first is to develop an understanding of the projects that are under consideration for funding this year. So again, I'll go over project summaries and scores in service of this goal. And then I'm also to, uh, happy to come back to any specific projects if you have questions on them during the discussion. And then as a follow on to this goal, um, our second objective here today is really to start a discussion of the types of things that this board would like to see in a potential programming scenario or scenarios, which we will discuss at the upcoming MPO meeting on March 17th. Um, and so really, you know, the focus today is if we can start to get a sense for your preferences, um, that will help me build out a scenario or multiple scenarios for, for the next MPO meeting. And so before we dive into that, I do want to sort of remind you where we are in the overall timeline for this year. Uh, as I've already noted, today's conversation is really focused on project scoring, uh, with the next two MPO meetings focused on the discuss discussion of potential funding scenarios for the new draft tip. As is the case each year, we'll need to have a draft scenario agreed upon by the end of March, as that scenario will be included in the larger draft tip document uh, that, will, that MPO staff anticipate releasing for public comment in late April after a vote by this board to do so. Uh, so checking these boxes over the next two weeks or so uh, will really put us on track for final tip endorsement by this board by the end of May of this year. I'd like to take a few minutes to highlight the public comments that we received on the tip since the, la uh, the last time this board met back on February 17th. Again, the full text of these comments is available on the MPO meeting calendar for your review. Uh, so over the last two weeks, we've received four written comments on two prospective tip projects. Uh, we've received three letters of support for the Belmont Community Path, which has again been scored for tip funding this year. Uh, these letters come from Patrice Garvin, Town Administrator of Belmont, Wesley Chin, the Director of the Belmont Department of Health, and Gloria Leipzig, the Chair of the Belmont Housing Authority. All three letters strongly support the project. The letter from Mr. Chin highlights the importance of the path for promoting healthy and active transportation in Belmont. While the letter from Ms. Leipzig notes that the project would create a, a critical connection for people walking and biking between uh, Belmont Housing Authority properties and the rest of the town. Town Administrator Garvin's letter provides a detailed update on the current status of the project. The letter notes the recent submission of 25% designs for the Belmont Community Path. 
NASDAQ is currently reviewing these plans, uh, and the proponent at the town of Belmont hopes that the design public hearing on those plans can be scheduled for later this spring. The letter states the proponent's desire to move forward quickly with 75 and 100% design after the 25% design plans are approved uh, and requests that the project be funded in this TIB cycle. Ms. Garvin notes that town, the town's uh, ongoing financial commitment to the project, uh, as the town has recently allocated $200,000 uh, to fund the necessary right-of-way work for the project, and that comes on top of more than $1.5 million in funding allocated at the local level to advance design of this project over the last several years. And uh, this letter concludes by noting that the town is really beginning to look ahead to phase two of this project, um, which would continue the proposed community path that's on the docket for, for tip scoring this year, um, connect the western end of that project with further west to uh, the Mass Central Rail Trail. So that'd be phase two of this project and the town is really looking forward to that as a, as a follow on, of course, to phase one that we are considering now. Uh, I do want to highlight also an update letter that we received on the Swampscott Rail Trail from Marzi Kalaska, the Director of Economic and Community Development for the town of Swampscott. The letter highlights recent progress made on the project. The proponent is working on resubmitting their 25% design plans to MassDOT, targeting a June 2022 submission date. Uh, this submission is dependent upon the completion of an ongoing geotechnical analysis, which is happening now. This letter includes a detailed breakdown of the other required elements of the 25% design submission and the current status of each of those items. Overall, the letter notes the importance of the rail trail for the community, as it will fill a critical gap in the regional trail network while providing enhanced access for people walking and biking, both to the Swampscott commuter rail station and to three schools in Swampscott. And I guess before we move on to this, uh, I do also want to flag that um, if you'll remember back to last year, both of these projects, uh, the Swampscott Rail Trail and the Belmont Community Path were the subject of significant public engagement. Uh, I think, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but I think combined those two projects drove upwards of 800 public comments last year. Most of the comments on both projects were in support of the projects, um, but each project uh, did have a few dozen comment letters apiece from mostly from abutters to the proposed project that were concerned about different elements of those projects. Um, so if it would be helpful, I'd be happy to bring those letters back to a, a future MPO meeting for your review. Uh, but again, there were uh, more than 800 of them, so lots to review. Um, so I'll leave that up to you all um, guidance uh, if you'd like to, to see those in some format going forward. Um, so moving on to the Community Connections Projects. Um, nine of the 11 proponents for Community Connections Projects this year submitted support letters as a part of their applications for funding. Uh, so in the application process for this specific program, proponents do have the chance to submit support letters from pro project co-sponsors and collaborators. And the submission of support letters can earn proponents up to three points for their projects. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all of these letters in detail, because as you'll see uh, summarized here, there are a number of them. Uh, but again, all of the letters have been posted to the MPO meeting calendar for your review. The general takeaway here is that many of the community connections projects that we're considering for funding this year represent robust collaborations between the lead project proponent and other partners. Many of these projects aim to fill gaps in the transportation system where there are needs that are not currently being met. And so that's a theme of a vast majority of these letters. I'll also briefly note that MPO staff did receive a handful of additional written comments within the last 48 hours in support of a couple of the community connections projects. Uh, and so those letters will be brought to the next MPO meeting on March 17th. All right, with all that table setting, let's dive into a discussion of the project scoring results for projects under consideration for funding this year. So in total, MPO staff scored 25 projects for funding, including 11 community connections projects, eight complete streets projects, two intersection improvement projects, two bicycle and pedestrian projects, and two major infrastructure projects. Um, roughly two thirds of the projects under consideration for funding this year have been scored in prior years, but were not funded uh, due to primarily funding limitations. As is the case every year, a majority of the new funding that this board can allocate to new projects is available in the fifth and final year of the forthcoming TIP, which this year is a federal fiscal year 2027. 
But unlike in most years, however, there is also new funding available in each fiscal year of the TIP beginning in federal fiscal year 2023. As we've discussed in recent meetings, this is due to the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law back in November. So we'll come back to a discussion of these funding numbers at the next MPO meeting as we discuss possible scenarios for programming these funds. So as in our last couple of MPO meetings, I do wanna remind this board one more time of the new uh, decision-making landscape for this year uh, that's resulting from the MPO's endorsement back in November of new project cost change policies. Uh, as we discuss, start to discuss the funding of new projects in this TIP cycle, this board will wanna keep in mind its decision to set a 25% design submission threshold for project programming. The policy committee and the larger MPO board have stated an intention to be flexible with this policy in year one of implementation. Uh, so that's something that we can continue to talk through today and over the next two MPO meetings as we get closer to a draft programming scenario for this year. Uh, and just as we heard uh, from the town of Wellington um, and also on the uh, Bridge Street project in Beverly earlier uh, in today's meeting, we'll continue to hear from project proponents that had any significant project cost increases over the next two MPO meetings. Uh, this is, again, a requirement of the new policies that were endorsed by this board back in November. A few final notes here to set the context for the scores on the coming slides. The scores you'll see throughout this presentation are all generated using the MPO's scoring criteria that were endorsed by this board back in October of 2020. So these scores are all on a 100 point scale and each investment program uses a slightly different set of criteria so that the scoring process better reflects the merits of each project. This means that we are not comparing the scores of complete streets projects to community connections projects, for example, uh, but rather we are comparing each project to other projects of its same project type within each investment program. I'll also highlight that these scores have been reviewed by project proponents. The scoring process is one that is collaborative between MPO staff and proponents, and having proponents review the scores helps staff ensure that each project is being fairly evaluated. So the scores you see today have been revised slightly based on proponent feedback as appropriate. I also wanna flag that uh, notes on each project's current status have been included on the following slides. And these statuses will generally fall into three different categories. Uh, first, PRC approved, which is sort of the minimum threshold for being considered for funding. Uh, and then 25% submitted, which typically means that the proponent has submitted designs to NASDOT and those designs are being reviewed. And then also you'll notice that uh, one project is noted as 25% rejected, uh, which means that it's 25% plans were submitted to NASDOT, but not accepted. And in this case, proponents are required to resubmit 25% plans before they can move forward with further stages of design. So these statuses all reflect NASDOT's current official designation for each project, but I'll highlight along the way when I have additional details to share on project status. Then finally, projects are listed by investment program in order, in order from highest to lowest scoring within each program. So it's a lot of table setting. Um, we are now gonna get into project scores. Again, these are broken down by NPO investment program. I'll start with our bicycle network and pedestrian connections projects. So first up is the Swampskit Rail Trail. This project is a 10 foot wide, 2.1 mile long multi-use trail connecting the existing Marblehead Rail Trail to the Swampskit Commuter Rail Station. This trail represents Swampskit's portion of the East Coast Greenway, which is an effort to create a 3,000 mile greenway running from Florida to Maine. The trail will make use of existing railroad abutments to create a bridge over Route 1A, and the town will host trail amenities, including uh, parking and bathrooms at Swampskit Middle School. This project has a total evaluation score of 66.4 points. And as you'll notice the status line here, uh, the proponent submitted their 25% designs to MassDOT back in January of 2021, uh, but these plans were rejected because they were incomplete. Um, as I noted, oops, sorry, my apologies. Uh, as I noted um, earlier in the project update letter on this project, uh, the proponent does intend to resubmit their 25% design plans in June of this year once the ongoing geotechnical analysis is complete. Next is the Belmont Community Path. Uh, this project is a 16 foot wide paved path connecting the existing Fitchburg Cutoff Path, uh, which connects to the ALY Fred Line Station 
to Belmont Center and the Belmont Commuter Rail Station. Uh, this project runs adjacent to Belmont High School and the Fitzburg Fitchburg Commuter Rail Line and includes an underpass under the active railroad tracks at Alexander Avenue. This project represents phase one of two for the Belmont portion of the Mass Central Rail Trail. And again, as I noted earlier, a second phase of this project is anticipated to connect further west, west to the Mass Central Rail Trail in Waltham. This project has a total score of 64.6 points and 25% designs were submitted for this project about two months ago and MassDOT is currently reviewing them. Moving now to complete streets projects. Oop, I see a raised hand here. Yeah, we're, we're, we're taking questions at the end, remember? Go ahead. We're taking questions at the end. We'll call on you, Daniel, at the end. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. So moving now to complete streets projects. Uh, first up is the reconstruction of Western Avenue in Lynn. This project will fully reconstruct 1.9 miles of Western Avenue, beginning just south of the Lynn-Salem border, heading south towards central Lynn. The project will enhance safety for all users along this high crash corridor uh, through improved design and signal operations, new signage and pavement markings. The project will also add new separated bike lanes and reconstruct existing sidewalks and ramps to bring them into ADA compliance. Furthermore, the project is exploring transit signal priority to accommodate MBTA bus routes 424, 434, and 450, while also include the reconstruction of existing bus stops. Western Avenue is the highest scoring complete streets project with a total overall score of 74.9 points. It scores particularly well in the safety category, given that this corridor co contains three of the top 200 crash locations in the state. This project has not yet submitted 25% design plans, but the project has held its pre-25% design scoping meeting with MassDOT, and the development of the 25% plans is currently underway. Next, we have the reconstruction of Park and Pearl Streets in Chelsea. This project aims to reconstruct Park and Pearl Streets as complete streets, providing enhanced mobility for all modes, but especially for people walking, biking, and taking transit. The project aims to support, support economic development and, and improved air quality in downtown Chelsea by improving sidewalks and crosswalks for pedestrian safety and implementing smart signal technology to support the movement of transit and other users. The corridor is also being considered for a future shared bus and bike lane, which would connect to the forthcoming work on nearby Broadway, a project that is funded by the MPO in federal fiscal year 2022, um, which should be moving forward with uh, advertisement for construction bid shortly. This project has an overall score of 69.9 points and remains at the PRC approval stage, which it reached back in January of 2021. In Salem uh, is the proposed Boston Street Improvement Project. This project aims to improve safety at a high crash location near the Salem Peabody border through the reconstruction of the roadway and the modernization of the corridor's signals. The project will create new off-street bicycle facilities that span the length of the corridor and will bring existing sidewalks, ramps, and bus stops into ADA compliance while addressing the existing poor condition of the roadway pavement. This project scores especially well in system preservation, equity, and economic vitality, has an overall score of 67.8 points. 25% designs were submitted to MassDOT for this project back in October of 2021, meaning that the project should be on its way to a design public hearing in the coming months once those plans are approved. Moving now to the rehabilitation of Washington Street in Brookline. This project aims to rehabilitate Washington Street as a true complete streets corridor. This project will add new protected bicycle lanes and support pedestrian safety through the reconstruction of sidewalks and the shortening of crossing distances at crosswalks. The project will also better, uh, better support MBTA bus operations through the relocation and consolidation of bus stops, the provision of pullout space at bus stops, and the implementation of transit signal priority. This project has an overall score of 62.4 points. Washington Street was PRC approved back in September of 2020. And while early design is, is, is advancing, the project has not yet had its pre-25% scoping meeting with MassDOT. Next up is the reconstruction of Route 30 in Weston. This project will reconstruct the roadway to create a corridor that better serves all users. 
The project includes geometric modifications and the modernization of signals to improve traffic flow and safety. The project also includes the reconstruction of a 10-foot shared use path along the 3.7 mile length of the corridor, creating bike facilities where none exist today and improving conditions for pedestrians as well. Of note, this project aims to connect its multimodal facilities with those being proposed on Route 30 in Newton, a project that is funded uh, in the TIP by MassDOT in federal fiscal year 2023. This project has an overall score of 49.2 points. 25% designs were submitted by Weston back in October of 2020, uh, and the proponent is aiming to schedule a design public hearing for the project in the near term. Moving north to the roadway improvement project on County Street, Nave Switch. Uh, the key goals of this project include the rehabilitation of a deteriorating stone arch bridge over the Nave Switch River, and improving conditions for people walking and biking by closing existing gaps in the sidewalk and bike network and enhancing safety at crossings. The project will bring the corridor into ADA compliance and support better connections to local destinations, including the nearby town center, the adjacent river walk, and other regional recreation areas. The project received a total score of 45.4 points. And it was PRC approved uh, back in January of 2021, and it remains a priority for the community, but 25% designs have not yet been submitted. Next up is the reconstruction of Main Street in Wakefield. Uh, the project will completely reconstruct Main Street and the surrounding roadways through downtown Wakefield. The project will narrow the existing roadway to include new dedicated bicycle facilities and expanded pedestrian facilities in the form of new shared use path along South Main Street. Shortened crossings and improved signals will further improve safety at intersections while increasing multimodal connectivity to the MBTA bus routes 136 and 137, the Wakefield commuter rail station and nearby re recreational assets, including the proposed Winfield, sorry, Wakefield Linfield Rail Trail, uh, which is MassDOT funded TIP project in 2026. This project has a total score of 40.8 points. And the project was PRC approved back in December of 2019 and a pre 25% scoping meeting was held with MassDOT, uh, but design prog progress since then has been unclear. And finally, last project in the complete streets category, uh, we have the Central Street Bridge reconstruction in Manchester by the Sea. This project aims to reconstruct the deteriorating bridge that carries Route 127 over Sawmill Brook in downtown Manchester by the Sea. Though this project will only reconstruct 225 feet of Central Street, the project preserves a key connection to the town center and the commuter rail station nearby. The project also prevents future flooding issues by enhancing drainage in the project area and addressing the existing tidal gate under the bridge, which is not currently functional. The project has an overall score of 34.8 points. And similar to the Wakefield project that we just discussed, uh, the project was PRC approved back in December of 2019, uh, but design progress since then has been unclear. We do have two intersection improvement projects seeking funding this year. First up is the intersection of Route 20 and Wellesley Street in Weston. This project will reconfigure the intersection to consolidate pavement area and simplify turning movements in order to improve safety at this high crash location. The project will install a new traffic signal to reduce congestion and will improve multimodal accommodations by reconstructing existing sidewalks, adding new sidewalks, and constructing bike lanes through the intersection where none exist today. Enhancements will also be made to the school bus stop that's located adjacent to the intersection. This project has a total score of 50.6 points. And Weston submitted 25% designs to MassDOT in May of 2021. And the design public hearing for this project was actually just held a couple of weeks ago back in mid-February. For our other intersection improvement project this year, we have uh, Squantum Street at Adams Street in Milton. This project will install a traffic signal at an intersection that is currently unsignalized in an effort to enhance safety and reduce queuing during peak hours along Squantum Street. Reconstruction of existing sidewalks to ADA standards and the addition of bike lanes where none exist today will further enhance the multimodal safety and accessibility at the intersection. This project has an overall score of 34.4 points. 25% design plans were submitted for this project back in November of 2020. Moving now to major infrastructure. 
First up is McGrath Boulevard in Somerville. McGrath Boulevard is programmed in the MPO's Long Range Transportation Plan in the 2025 through 2029 time bands. This project will greatly enhance connectivity between the neighborhoods in East Somerville by bringing the elevated McCarthy Viaduct down to an at-grade urban boulevard. The reconstructed roadway will include a mix of off-street and protected bicycle facilities, as well as a completely rebuilt and widened uh, sidewalks throughout the corridor. The improvements along McGrath will connect with the extended Somerville community path and will improve multimodal access to the forthcoming Green Line extension, uh, which includes new stations at nearby Union Square and East Somerville. The project is also exploring significant investments in transit priority along the corridor, including transit signal priority, floating bus stops, and bus queue jump lanes at key intersections. This project has an overall score of 72.2 points. And the project was originally approved by MassDOT's Project Review Committee back in 2014, uh, though MassDOT is currently leading the development of 25% design plans to support this project um, as it continues to move forward. For our other major infrastructure projects, uh, we're moving to the Route 9 and 27 interchange project in Natick. This project involves the complete reconfiguration of the existing interchange and overpass into a modified diverging diamond. Uh, the existing Route 27 bridge over Route 9 was built in 1931 and is listed as structurally deficient. Um, and the bridge currently does not include appropriate multimodal accommodations. So the modified interchange will include dedicated off-street facilities for pedestrians and bicyclists, including a separate bike ped bridge over Route 9 in between two spans that will support vehicular traffic. The enhanced shared use facilities will improve connections to Natick Center and the nearby Cochituate Rail Trail. This project uh, scores particularly well in capacity management and mobility in clean air and sustainable communities and has an overall score of 57.7 points. Like Somerville, this project is programmed in the fiscal years 25 through 29 time band in the long range plan, making both of these projects relatively near term priorities for funding. 25% designs were submitted for this project back in February of 2020, uh, but I believe MassDOT's intention is to refile 25% design plans in the near term with some additional updates to the design. Last but not least, uh, I'll run through the scoring results for the community connections projects for this year. Unlike all the projects I just discussed, a vast majority of these projects are new to the TIP process this year. Beginning with our highest scoring project, which is the expansion of NUMO microtransit service in Newton. This project requests funding over a three year period and represents an expansion of the service that the MPO has already contributed funding to through the current TIP. As a reminder, the MPO has allocated $727,000 to the current phase of this project between federal fiscal years 2021 and 2023. So this new proposed project aims to expand the existing service in Newton by adding new stop locations at key destinations in neighboring communities, including Watertown, Waltham, Weston, Wellesley, Needham, and Boston. The goal of the project broadly is to continue to leverage uh, this service to connect riders to job centers, activity hubs, and existing fixed route transit, while building on the strong base of ridership that exists for the current service. This project has an overall evaluation score of 87 points, as it scores well across all categories and it, again is the highest growing project within our community connections program. We have three projects that are tied with the second highest score in this program uh, with a total of 78 points. The first of those being a blue bikes station replacement and system expansion project in the city of Cambridge. Cambridge is requesting roughly $350,000 to replace five existing blue bike stations and add two new stations to add much requested locations within the city. Uh, these new stations are proposed at the Callanan Playground in West Cambridge and then Harvard Square at Church Street. On top of these new stations, the replacement of five existing docks would allow Cambridge to maintain a state of good repair for their blue bike system citywide. These five stations are all approximately 10 years old and were among the first stations installed in the city when blue bikes first launched more than a decade ago. Over the last couple of years, Cambridge has seen significant growth in the usage of their blue bike system. And so this project aim, aims to accommodate that growth and ensure that the system continues to serve residents and visitors well in the years to come. Also with 78 points is the expansion of the blue bike system in Medford and Malden. 
These two communities are requesting approximately $146,000 to further expand their blue bikes networks. The MPO is currently funding the installation of six blue bike stocks in these cities through the fiscal years 22 through 26 tip. So this project would build upon that work and help to grow the overall blue bike system in this part of the region. This project proposes the addition of four new stations, uh, three in Medford and one in Malden. Proposed station locations include along Medford Street in Malden, near the Northern Strand Community Trail, at Main Street and Harvard Street in Medford, near the forthcoming College Avenue and Ball Square and ETA Green Line stations, and then at two locations within the Mystic River State Reservation. The proponents note that the addition of these stations will help them achieve a critical mass of blue bike stocks in their communities, helping the system as a whole to flourish. Our third 78 point project is the expansion of shuttle service along Pleasant Street in Watertown. An earlier version of this project was proposed last year, but not selected for funding. Uh, this project is requested is requesting roughly $800,000 over three years in support of this expansion effort, which will build upon the shuttle service recent, recently launched this past fall, uh, which you heard about uh, during public comments at the outset of this meeting. The current shuttle runs along Pleasant Street in Watertown connecting key residential and commercial hubs to fixed route transit in Watertown Square and Harvard Square. The goal of the expansion is to double service levels uh, from once per hour to twice per hour and to switch from gas powered vehicles to a fleet of two all electric shuttles. This project is a partnership between the town of Watertown, the Watertown TMA, and numerous business and residential developments along Pleasant Street. Closely behind these three 78 point projects is the expansion of the blue bike system in Salem, with, which has a total evaluation score of 77 points. Salem is requesting roughly $120,000 to add three new blue bike stations in the city. These stations would build upon the network of seven existing stations across Salem. The main goal of the project is to continue to build out the local blue bikes network so that it can increasingly function as a robust option for first and last mile connections between Salem's fixed route transit options, including the ferry, commuter rail, and MBTA bus service, and key local destinations, such as schools and the hospital. The proponent hopes that this project will complement Salem's uh, growing system of shared use paths and bike lanes. And the project is supported by several partners, including Salem State University, Salem Hospital, and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Up next is the creation of a shuttle service in Stoneham, which has an evaluation score of 72 points. This project requests approximately $630,000 over three years to support the creation of a new shuttle service within the town of Stoneham. Uh, as you heard earlier during today's public comment period, uh, the main goal of this project is to foster east-west connections across Stoneham and between Stoneham and neighboring communities, as well as between transit hubs in the region. Currently, Stoneham has just one MBTA bus route, which runs north-south, limiting the potential for residents and workers to use non-single occupancy vehicles for cross-town trips. This project proposes a fixed route shuttle service during peak commuting hours, um, but then during off-peak hours, the shuttle would support off-route trips as requested by riders. Of note, this project re received the most letters of support from project stakeholders through the application process for community connections projects, uh, eight letters of support were submitted by the town and various stakeholders, including local employers. Almost there, just a handful more to go. So thank you, thank you all for bearing with me. Um, up next, CADA is proposing the expansion of the CADA On Demand Microtransit Service. This project has an overall score of 61.75 points. This project requests roughly $650,000 in support of this expanded service for CADA On Demand. The, cur uh, the current service covers much of the city of Gloucester, and this expansion proposes the addition of the town of Rockport, Rockport as well as the Lanesville neighborhood of Gloucester to the service area. The existing service started out as a commuter-focused shuttle, but demand for the service has since evolved to include families, students, and people accessing medical appointments, among others. So the goal of this expansion is to allow the service to better support these sorts of non-work trips through throughout both Gloucester and Rockport. Similarly, uh, Metro West RTA is proposing an expansion of their Catch Connect microtransit service. The project has a score of 59 points. MWRTA is requesting approximately $120,000 per year over three years 
in support of this project, uh, which proposes to expand Catch Connect service to the towns of Hudson and Marlborough in the Metro West region. These towns are currently not well served by fixed route transit uh, with significant last mile gaps between existing and WRTA uh, fixed route service and key employment and residential destinations. So MWRTA aims to fill those gaps with this project, complementing their existing fixed route network. Uh, shuttles could be requested be, via the existing Catch Connect app or over the phone, providing an on-demand option to enhance mobility throughout these communities. Acton has proposed the installation of bicycle parking at key locations along Great Road and the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. The project has an overall score of 58 points. This project will install three bike racks, accommodating a total of 18 bicycles at three commercial centers along Great Road. The goal of the project is to enhance connectivity between these commercial centers and the adjacent Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, allowing users of the trail to stop along their rides to frequent local businesses. The proponent notes that this project will help, help to further create bicycle connections to transit in the region, will support the use of existing open space. The town also notes that this project is complementary to their broader COVID recovery strategy for small businesses in the community. The project is requesting a total of roughly $8,000 in support of this work. Two more projects here. Uh, next is the Montesquieu RTA, uh, which has proposed the creation of a microtransit service in the Magic subregion. This project has an overall score of 57 points. This project is the other community connections project uh, that was scored last year, but was not selected for funding. So currently, uh, non-single occupancy vehicle transportation options are extremely limited in the communities of Bolton, Foxborough, Littleton, and Stowe. And so this project's aim, project aims to fill those gaps by creating a microtransit service in those communities that connects residents to local employment centers and activity hubs. The project will utilize Mart's existing fleet of vehicles will allow users to book rides using the Q Ride platform. The proponent has requested a little over a million dollars in funding support for this project over three years. And then finally, uh, as you heard again earlier during the public comment portion of today's meeting, uh, the town of Belmont has proposed the installation of a bike rack shelter at Janary Middle School. Uh, this project has a total score of 49.75 points. The project aims to support year-round bicycling to school for students, uh, many of whom bike in nicer weather, but elect not to bike during poor weather due to the lack of covered bicycle parking at the school. The proponent notes that a significant portion of students live within comfortable biking distance of school, and that this project would help to encourage those students to bike. The goal of the project is really to reduce the need for student drop-off and pickup in personal vehicles, promoting safety and active transportation while reducing the greenhouse gas emissions that result from students being driven to school. The project represents a collaborative effort between Chinnery Middle School and students and families through the Chinnery PTO. Made it. So thank you all for bearing with me. I know we have a lot of projects on the docket today. Um, but, you know, the, really the intention is to give you a broad overview of, of sort of everything that's on the radar. And again, you know, we can discuss these in more detail both during today's conversation and then at upcoming meetings. Um, so if you do have questions on any of that, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, but in addition to clarifying anything about projects under consideration, uh, staff's hope is that we can also start a discussion of the types of things that this board might want to see in a programming scenario or scenarios for this year, um, which again, we will be coming back to at the next MTO meeting. So speaking of those next steps, just want to make sure that we're all on the same page about where we're going from here. At the next MTO meeting on March 17th, uh, we will discuss initial programming scenarios for the funding of new projects this year. And the intention is really to have a final scenario selected, selected by the March 31st MPO meeting, uh, which will then again come up for a vote for this board to release for public comment in late April. That is it. Uh, thank you for bearing with me through all that. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, Matt. Dale Amstutz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Matt, for that thorough overview of all the projects. Um, what I wanted to say earlier and what I'll, I'll say now and maybe have other comments in a moment, but um, you had sort of offered or, or, or uh, <clears throat> noted how the Belmont Community Path and the Swampscott Rail Trail were very um, 
uh, had a lot of public engagement or public letters and everything last year. And so a two-year offer to bring those back, I think personally, I think it would be more useful if the maybe the proponents of both of those could um, you know, talk about what the concerns of the community were or of those different letters. Uh, you know, some of them came from direct abutters. You know, how obviously both projects have kind of uh, proceeded along over the past year. Um, so understanding sort of how the 25% design maybe is, has responded to some of those comments. Um, so we don't have to sort of go over every single or, or, or see every single comment again, but I think it'd be, um, you know, helpful to have a bit more, um, you know, how they're, how they're moving ahead. And also, I think there was some, uh, they talked about, some of the letters talked about support from town meeting. And if, you know, if that was like an overwhelming support, you know, if 90% of people supported that, uh, you know, funding for the project, I think that's great. I think that's helpful to understand that the project is pretty well supported by the community and, and is moving ahead. Um, and then the, other thing, just a question about 25% rejected for Swampscott. Uh, I guess what you said, it was not enough information. Uh, so I'm just curious, is the cost estimate for that, you know, we've talked about the cost estimate and um, how the 25% design helps to refine that. Is the cost estimate for that Swampscott project uh, not, or, or is it still basically a conceptual estimate because 25% wasn't, um, wasn't uh, was rejected. So I'm just curious because I've never. I don't think I've seen that that uh, status designation before. Yeah, uh, happy to respond to both points. Uh, on the first point, I can definitely touch base with both proponents and encourage them to come in and maybe provide a you know a few minute update on sort of you know where their projects are in relation to you know response to to public comments. Uh, I do know that both communities have been working with the butters to address concerns. Um, and so probably best to hear that information from them. And so I can, I can you know, work with them to see if they can come to an upcoming meeting. Um, and then on your second question, the cost estimate for the Swampscott Rail Trail is the same as what it was you know, when we originally had that project come up on our radar uh, when it was PRC approved. And so it hasn't been updated in, you know, since it was PRC, I don't have the date right off the top of my head, but, um, you know, so it hasn't been updated as a result of any new design submissions, given that the you know submission wasn't wasn't reviewed. Um, and so I think it's fair to say that that is a relatively conceptual estimate, just as you know any other PRC estimate would be, um, that we would expect to see some level of change in you know a, an updated estimate once the twenty five percent design plans are submitted and reviewed by MassDOT. Um, but you know in terms of the magnitude or directionality of that cost change, you know, hard to say at this point until, until that review happens. Thank you, that's good to know. Jay Monty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I have kind of a general, you know, just comment. We've, we've got a lot of projects here, a lot of great projects. I'm sure I'll have a lot of discussion about them over the coming weeks, but there are a few that are, um, you know, LRTP projects, projects that are big ticket items. Um, and, you know, give the context, I know we have in Rutherford move shifting a little bit um, schedule wise. I'd like to maybe at some point for this couple of weeks just understand kind of where we're headed with these larger projects, you know, McGrath, um, projects in Lynn, and there's one other one um, that are big ticket and just given the funding um, issues we're having now, uh, just seeing kind of how those play out over the next two years. And um, I'll leave it as kind of a general comment like that for now, but that's just my initial thought. Thank you, Jay. Lynn Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, so yeah, one of my initial thoughts is I think that we are probably in the best funding situation um, we've been in for a while that we may likely find ourselves. Um, and so I don't, be, how do I appreciate the outreach feed from, from colleagues in Somerville? You know, a, independently of that, I mean, I really would like to see us get the McGrath project, you know, uh, program for some at some point in the near future because it looks like a really good program. Uh, so a, quite, a couple of requests, you know. Uh, so I mean, the the the, um, the PDF that you provided me with the more extensive scoring you know, was very helpful. I really like it a lot, especially having very. Uh, uh, but I I um I wanted to understand or remember how we we adjusted the safety 
um, points, I mean, um, when we, how we scale them. And I went through all my, my um, downloaded files and I couldn't find that. I saw like the, the handout that really gets very granular into how we score things and that's really good. But, but I don't know if we actually have, do we have a document that explains me how we do the, the criteria? I mean, I know we've had several pre presentations on it. I mean, yeah, so sorry, just to clarify. So are you asking for just a summary of the current criteria or a summary of, of how the current criteria changed from the last criteria? No, no, the current criteria and, and, and how we do the scaling. I mean, so, so for instance, on the, the equity chain um, points, I mean, you have like your aura equity points and then you scale them. And, and I remember Betsy presenting that. You know, uh, uh, but if, is there a document I mean, that we can refer to? And kind of along those lines, I think it would be good if we had like a explainer, a small explainer um, with the um, PDF that you provide to the board members just so that it, if we have any questions, we can just go there and get it. I mean, so, um, but was there a document in addition to the PDF on how we do the conversion? Yeah, so we definitely have uh, something that I'd be happy to, to send okay. on after the meeting. Okay, um, great. Uh, so, so, um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation. Appreciate it. Aiden Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Matt, uh, just a, a question about the, uh, on the community connections scoring. Uh, I noticed there's something now, there's a score for fiscal sustainability. Is that the, uh, score uh, is that whether the applicant can implement the program, including the, C, the the funding that they get from the NPF, or is that an estimate of whether they can continue the project after the CMAC after the CMAC funding is on that? Because remember, that's the the whole point of CMAC funding is to in effect the you know uh, get things up and running, but they should be uh, sustainable once they are once they once the federal funding. Uh, yes, we, we do look at, um, yeah, sort of, we ask sort of a range of questions of proponents on that subject. And so, you know, one of the things we're asking is, have you identified, if you're an operations project, you know, have you identified year four or beyond of funding, or do you have a plan in place to identify that? And so, you know, a lot of proponents will talk about um, outreach they're doing to businesses, you know, maybe, you know, money that they're allocating in the town budget going forward, things of that nature. Um, and so we are asking those sorts of questions and we do expect proponents to give us, you know, some level of detail on, on their future um, ability to keep the service going, as well as to meet, you know, the matching requirements of the initial grants. Because, because I know, if I may, because I noticed that they all got the score of 10. So if it's, if, if the question is whether they can implement the program, you know, provide them action, all that kind of stuff, that's, that's like pass fail, right? Uh, either they can or they can't. Uh, and then if they can't, they shouldn't even be scored. Uh, that shouldn't even really be part of the criteria, I, I, I would say. Um, I did have another suggestion perhaps and that, you know, it would be maybe helpful to also have a summary table. Uh, you know, it's a list, you know, we get this big, you know, it's great getting the documentation, but it would be great if there was a summary table which just should, listed the projects by category. And then, you know, maybe this, the scores by of the major categories and the costs and that kind of stuff. I think that might be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, Ken. Next, back to Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I've forgotten one question, but also that matrix. I mean, I think Ken was getting at the matrix. I mean, we want to see the matrix. Hey, but but uh, um, it's cost-benefit analysis. I mean, uh, we, we did some we work I mean, last year, and we had like the grid I mean, that help us kind of compare projects with respect to the cost. Are there plans to present us with that? That's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I definitely could um, plot all these projects on, on that same grid and then bring that back as a reference for future decision making. That'd be helpful at, at the next meeting. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. David Kozis. Can you guys hear me? I don't see you anymore. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so we have a few or maybe one or two very, very small requests for community connections funding um, this time around. And I remember in the past we had, you know, a discussion about the staff work involved in getting some of these small ticket 
items through the pipeline. And, you know, they seem like good ideas, but do we still have this issue in terms of the level of effort involved on the, you know, and is it worth the effort? Um, or is there some other way to fund some of these very, very small requests? That is a great question. Um, so thank you for raising that topic. Um, you're definitely right in saying that, you know, we had a, a number of discussions about that at MPO meetings back last fall. Um, so today the conversation is really focused on just giving you a sense for who's applied and sort of what they're asking for, what, you know, what their intentions are with their project. Um, over the next couple of MPO meetings, you know, our intention as, as MPO staff, working with MassDOT Matt, staff and with um, MAPC staff is to talk about you know, potential pathways for moving these projects forward and sort of what that would entail, uh, including the question of capacity to manage contracts. And so those are conversations that are, are ongoing uh, and sort of, uh, you know, and we'll have a little bit more guidance for, for you all as at the board level, um, we anticipate at the next MPO meeting. Okay, thank you, Matt. Dennis G and Betty. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question. I assume that all of the, um, Cities and towns have been notified of the of their tip project, and that they'll be will be considering them over the coming over the coming weeks, so they can start advocating. No. Yeah. So all um, all proponents, you know, have been you know active in the application process. So they've submitted materials, and then um, they've gotten probably you know more emails than they'd like to from me over the last several weeks, um, having a chance to you know get updates on the scoring process, review their draft scores provide feedback on them, um, and then we've sent out, you know, final scores. And so, um, so I do, um, in anticipation of every board meeting, send out emails to, you know, all prospective proponents with projects in the pipeline, um, just about what they can expect at the coming board meeting, how they can advocate for their projects, all those sorts of things. And so um, folks are, um, are certainly aware of, of how they can be involved. Um, that's, you know, will continue to be a priority over the next uh, month or so as we uh, make key decisions. Daniel Amstutz. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. And um, just to piggyback a little bit on what David just mentioned, um, I think another area of concern that we discussed at the, uh, in the fall uh, when it came to eligible projects in the Community Connections Grant um, was obviously these um, uh, transit projects sort of um, operating over a couple of years time and sort of the, the challenges of MassDOT managing that. So I guess that's uh, just, just sort of flagging that as, as I guess something that will come up or assume <laughs> will come up in the next couple of meetings and, and how to deal with that. So um, yeah, I think we, we all know that, but I'm just sort of stating uh, the obvious. Thank you, Daniel. John Romano. Um, Mr. Chair, if it's okay, um, kind of through you to Eric, um, uh, uh, is the ad hoc committee going to get together to review um, any of any of this? Um, I think we talked about possibly doing that um, when uh, when we started having this discussion. Yes, we. I think we did discuss a potential uh, opportunity for the ad hoc committee to come back together um, and look at sort of the project costs and what was before us. Um, I think that would have to be a, you know, ultimately a decision of the chair. I'm, I'm happy to, to do that, whether that makes sense as the ad hoc committee or the full, you know, MPO, because we're sort of in tip development. Um, you know, I don't like, I, I think the purpose of pulling the ad hoc group together would be if we had sort of like a recommendation about the process. I feel like now we're sort of in tip development and we kind of just need, we kind of need to just like, you know, make some decisions about what's before us. I guess that's, that would be my initial thought thoughts about this, but I'd be happy to, you know, hear what others, you know, think about that. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely willing to, to do, you know, anything that, that folks want. <clears throat> so, so let, let me, Reframe the issue a little. So, I don't think it it's necessary for the ad hoc committee to to meet to talk about Matt's presentation today. 
but there is, I'm not, I wasn't clear, does the ad hoc committee want to do a deeper dive into the three projects that have gone over the 25% threshold? Um, you know, we heard from ab advocate, not advocates, advocates, um, designers and, and communities today about those projects. Do you want to just handle that at the MPO or do you want to actually meet as an ad hoc committee to talk about it in more detail with each individual applicant and have like a presentation from each individual no. applicant? I, I feel like that's that that information should be in front of the MPO, and I actually really appreciated, for example, um, the uh, you know the 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 town of the city of Woburn coming today. I thought that level of detail. I think it was yes. What's um, that? I think she was from Wilmington, but yes. I'm sorry, Wilmington. That that level of detail was um, was exactly what I think we want to hear. Is what are the you know what are those issues? And and I appreciate you know Rich. As, as well. So I, I don't feel like we, I don't feel like we need to do that unless others want to dig deeper. Okay. Tom Bent. Uh, Mr. Chair, as a member of the ad hoc committee, I agree with that, Eric. Uh, I think all that information should be, you know, brought out at the full uh, MPO. Um, and uh, I think that's really what our attention was. Uh, one thing though, I did notice, you know, and I, going you know looking at what matt uh put forward was it looks like uh only ha half the uh, projects i think that was submitted are at 25 percent so that's a you know that might be another thing that we'll need to talk about but uh, uh and again it was for this for this year it was only you know we weren't going to hold that people to that um because it was the first year that we brought that up so uh but i just thought that was interesting if my math is right yeah, and, and Mr. Chair, if if you, if you don't Go mind, ahead. on that point, I mean, I think we, you know, that was one of the things we struggled with is that we know that there are a lot of projects that aren't at that level, and so um, you know, I think we said all along that you know we were going to be very flexible with you know with this sort of you know policy that we weren't creating any any you know things written in stone or 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 like hard lines, but that we really did want. You know, we wanted to program projects that were further along where we had a better sense of what the, the cost, you know, estimate is. And we did a really for, thorough, I feel like, discussion and investigation of, you know, all the things that, that influenced that. So, uh, but thank you, Tom. I appreciate those points. Other comments from MPO members before I open it up to the public? John Romano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say that I, I just wanted to raise that and that I um, absolutely agree with Eric and yourself and Tom that doing it at the full um, board is the right way to go. Thank, Thank you. John. Any other MPO members before we open it up to the public? Seeing none, Vincent Stanton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Vincent Stanton. I live in Belmont. I'm a member of the Select Board Appointed Community Path Project Committee. In response to uh, Mr. Amstutz's question about uh, whether the project proponents could respond to uh, some of the issues raised by abutters, last year, a letter dated March 17th from our committee, co-signed by the uh, three members of the Belmont Select Board, the town administrator, the town engineer, and others, um, a four and a half page letter uh, did address those issues, uh, enumerated uh, the town support in terms of town meeting votes, the public process, which dates to 2012. I personally, this is the third of three select board committees. I have been a member uh, of all three. Um, the first uh, was appointed in 2012. So I've personally been in uh, several hundred uh, public meetings, um, you know, each of which has had a, uh, a um, opportunity for members of the, the public to, to uh, raise issues. We've held multiple public forums, each of those three committees. So, um, so we can, we can write another letter this year, but I just want to point out that some of that information is um, on the record. If, if, I, if I could, I also have a, a few questions through you to uh, Mr. Genova. 
he, he, he said that uh, the project's uh, scores could not be considered cross category, but should be considered within category. But in fact, it's my understanding from uh, our, a meeting of ours that he attended that even that is not strictly true. Belmont, for example, is in the inner core, and we were told that um, in important uh, uh, aspects of project scoring, it would be not uh, correct to directly compare the Belmont project with the Swampscott project, Swampscott being an, a maturing suburb, I believe. So I think that, in fact, it's within project category, and if the two uh, towns are in the same uh, you know, categorized in, in the same um, manner that only then would it actually be fair to make a direct comparison of the scores. Um, I, I also just want to note that uh, in the, the summary, um, Mr. Genovese stated that the uh, path was 16 feet wide. It's 12 feet wide with a four foot um, earth buffer. So and not uh, proposing to pave um, 16 feet across. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. Bruce Benevento. Yes, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I wanted to uh, just, uh, we talked about, I talked about Beverly a little earlier, but two of the projects that were identified, um, both the uh, Western App project in Lynn and the Washington Street uh, project in Brookline, uh, we are involved in, in both of those. Uh, obviously, Lynn, very excited that it's the highest scoring project in the Complete Streets category. Uh, in Brookline ranking fourth. Um, just, just some considerations. I, uh, these projects are in the 25% design phase, but have not been submitted yet. Uh, but given that they're, um, they're higher priced projects, um, just, uh, just a, either a note or just something to, th to think about in terms of um, placing them on the tip uh, so that there are placeholders for them, given the size of the projects. Um, especially as the projects move forward, uh, having those placeholders, because the projects are in 25% design, there will be a 25% submittal, uh, but perhaps they're pl placed in an out year just to, as a placeholder, uh, given the size of the project. So just you know, something to consider about that. One other thing too, um, and I don't know uh, if uh, Eric's subcommittee would, you know, kept these things in mind. I know we were looking at, uh, they were looking at uh, costs of projects, but I think one of the other things too with projects that we see all the time is just time, um, projects being delayed. Uh, two things happen when the projects are delayed, as you know. One, they affect the, you know, the TIP programming. Uh, and two, the, generally the costs go up because the, the longer they sit, <laughs> the more they cost. So uh, you know, just, uh, just things to think about. And I know the MPO is probably thinking about these things, but you know, certainly uh, at least with the communities I'm working with, I'm constantly uh, bringing this to their attention as well. One of the things that we're seeing now are the changes in the right-of-way process. Um, there's uh, certainly uh, more, um, more hurdles to, to get over. Um, uh, donations, uh, now with donations, if you get a donation from a, from an, a butter and there's a uh, mortgage on that property, you now get, need to get a sign off by the bank as well. Um, if you're paying someone in fee, you have to have uh, not only the property owner, but the bank on that. So there's gonna be some additional, maybe not necessarily delays, but certainly um, um, more things to do as these, as these projects move forward. And certainly things that we're mindful of just in terms of time. But again, just the advocating for the Western Ave project and Lynn, we know that that's also an extension of the 107 project that's underway um, uh, that extends from this project into Salem all the way to Boston Street in Salem. So uh, this is a, the Western Ave project is a key project and certainly the Washington Street project as well. And, Matt did a nice job of talking about that project this morning. We're hopeful that uh, we're going to be having the um, uh, the pre-25 scoping meeting with MassDOT uh, very soon. Uh, Brookline has created a design review committee within Brookline, uh, so they're very uh, bullish on getting this project moving and and having you know sort of a robust process. In both projects, we uh, have a public engagement consultant on board to get the public involved. So we know that there's been overwhelming public support for both of those projects. So again, just wanted to bring those up. Good projects, I think, for the region and, uh, and hopefully they move forward. Thanks. Marzi Galaska. 
Good morning, Mr. Chairperson, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Marzi Galaska, Town of Swamska, Community Development Director. Um, as you notice, I did provide a, um, an update letter regarding the uh, Swamska Rail Trail project, project that was included in your package today, but I'm also happy to address um, some of the issues maybe just quickly, and then I can provide you with a written update in regards to uh, recapping some of the resident concerns or neighbors' concerns. Um, most of the concerns, as you have heard uh, about last year, was about um, the location of the, tra the trail and the proximity of the, um, the residential homes, as well as some issues about um, um, right of way, uh, perhaps how the uh, uh, rail the rail corridor was uh, initially acquired. Um, that is something that you know, the town is willing to work with uh, the trail neighbors to assure that we can design the trail in, in, the, best, um, in the best process and the best way. Um, but again, I will address this in a letter to you. I just wanted to quickly provide an update regarding the overwhelming support for the trail project through our town meeting, through the select board, uh, through our town administration, through all of our land use board, as well as our residents and the Friends of the Swampscott Rail Trail. Um, the Friends of the Swampscott Rail Trail have been amazing community partner. They actually uh, provided a town with $150,000 towards design or to complete the, um, the design of the project. As you know, right now we have a uh, a consultant that is working on the 25% design. We are actually prepared to advance the design through um, 75 to 100% design uh, to assure that we can be programmed in, in this uh, TIP cycle. The project is uh, needed and it's really um, detrimental to our school project that the town is building right now. We have a 900 student K through um, four grade school that is being built right adjacent to the trail. And we hope that um, this trail or this project could work in concurrent with the construction of the school that will begin this fall. So again, that's um, a, um, a wonderful community asset to really provide cross town connection uh, to the school and to the many um, areas that uh, from uh, the commerce centers to playgrounds, uh, to schools, and actually to the connection to the Marblehead Trail, uh, Rail Trail as Matt had earlier, um, earlier mentioned. Uh, one thing just quickly, just to let you know, is that the reason for the 25% resubmittal to MassDOT was that our initial 25% design did not include um, the design of the bridge that is going over uh, Route 1A or Paradise Road. So that was the only reason that MassDOT requested that we provide additional information. So we are actively working on it. And as I stated in the letter, we have the uh, the geotech work schedule, but because of the um, the schedule for the consultant that's doing the work, as well as the weather, it's been a little bit prob problematic, but we are working to advance it, and I will provide further written update. Hopefully, this provides you with, with a sense of our readiness, as well as the, um, our, um, uh, uh, you know, need for the project and the, so the overwhelming support of the project as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gosper. Any other comments at this time from members of the public or the board? Seeing none, we'll see you at the next meeting, Matt. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda are member items. Are there any items to come before the MPO today? Seeing and hearing none, can I get a motion and a second to adjourn from a member and please state your name for the record. Eric Barassa. This is Eric Barassa, and I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you for a great meeting, everyone. Lynn Diggins. Stating that name for the record, Leonard Diggins seconds that motion. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Once we all give a round of applause to Rosine Foley, we will adjourn. Yay. Bye, Rosine. It was great working with you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, David. Likewise. Have a great couple of weeks. We'll see you in a, in a couple of weeks, except you, Rosine. Have a great couple of weeks, but we just won't see you. Bye, everybody.